Okay, we're going to get started. All right, hey everybody. Um, again, we're going to uh, let's welcome CTI for the round of applause. Um, we're going to have another workshop. This workshop is going to be a little bit different than the earlier one. It was less of us, and actually it's going to be more geared for advanced students, I guess you could say. Um, so for you that are in a praise team or want to be in a praise team, um, we're going to aim this to teach you what does it mean to be in a praise team, how to work together, and more musical training. So hopefully you guys will enjoy this workshop. All right, here we go. workshop is a little bit more advanced and is a little bit more interactive. Um, so what we'll be doing this afternoon um, is talking about the different parts of what makes a band. So earlier we talked about um, what is worship, how do we worship, why do we worship. And um, as worship leaders, a lot of the times, most of the times I would say, um, we're creating this space for other people to be led into worship. So how do we create that space in a way that's not distracting? So um, this afternoon we're going to talk about the various parts of, of the band, of, of what um, we need to do together to um, effectively communicate the message that we want to get across. Um, so I know we'll, we'll have room for questions afterwards, but um, I, we won't talk a lot about specific like individual techniques, so how to play the guitar better, or how to sing with lots of runs, or anything like that, because those are things that um, we can probably do on our own. But we will talk about what works, um, what we can do more of, what we can do less of, how to serve the people that we are on stage with, how to uh, um, create that space, not only for us on the platform, but also for the people in the audience. Um, and again, the, we're going to talk about this in a way that, um, that basically shows that this is not just the only way to do it. Um, this is not the only way to lead worship. This is not the only way to be a part of a praise band. Uh, we just found that this is an effective way to do it. So we're going to show you what works for us, and hopefully you can accommodate those things to work for your praise teams as well. Um, also, um, just a little plug, um, we do do summer teams with CTI that are six weeks long, and this program is actually about a year long. So I don't know if you are musicians, and or a sound tech and interested in integrating your passion for music with missions and doing God's, God's will um, in that way. We'd love to talk to you about this. So I'll let Maddie take it away. So Kirsten kind of mentioned that we'll be showing you guys um, what we have found to be the most effective, um, the most effective way to put together a band, but we also realize that um, that not all great teams have you know, all of these instruments. Um, but so we wanted to break this down in kind of a way that there are three basic components to a band. So the first part we're going to talk about is the rhythm section. So just to take a shot in the dark, um, can someone maybe throw out like an, an instrument that they think is in the rhythm section? Yes. Keyboard? Time, well, um, <laughs> so we'll have a drum. So that's okay, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Um, so, to keep, so for rhythm section, so we would have, <laughs> that's okay, um, Alex, the <laughs> yes, that could be one of them, so what we would say normally is like drums, so in many cases that could be like a djembe, a cajon, um, anything you feel like you want to just kidding, drums are so much more than that. Sorry, Joey. Um, but yeah, so the, um, one of the instruments in the rhythm section is drums. And so obviously they do that by you know, keeping time and making sure that the band um, is on the ball. And the other instrument that is in the rhythm section would be bass guitar, um, which is patty. So what they do is they set the foundation for the song by keeping the rhythm, and everyone else kind of works off of them. Uh, so the next uh, the second section of the band that we'll talk about is um, the harmonic section. So, any guesses? No, like it's totally <laughs> um, So, any guesses of what might be in the harmonic section? Electric? Okay, so like guitar is one of them. Uh, and then also uh, piano or keys. And so, what they will do 
is um, they'll work together to complement each other by playing different things. So maybe Hannah will be, you know, doing a more rhythmic thing, like she'll be strumming an acoustic guitar, and Matt or Holly will be playing like um, a kind of piano pad or more. Um, they'll be doing chords, so they'll do that by complementing each other and not necessarily playing the exact same thing. But um, yes, and then the last section um, is the melodic section, and so that would be vocals or in some cases keys and guitar when they are like doing like a guitar solo or um, or like leading. Or, oh, yes. <laughs> Um, and they do that by, um, <laughs> they would accomplish that by um, adding like texture. So sometimes they'll be, um, yes, um, <laughs> yeah, so vocals, like what they do is that they are kind of like delivering the message of that and that could be either through words or with a leading instrument, that could be with um, you know a lead line, like playing the melody of a line in the song. Um, and I forgot to mention backup vocals, and but also with keys and guitar, they can add texture to songs, and that's really important because when everyone is doing um, maybe like a rhythm and there's no texture to the song, it can get kind of lost. So three parts of it. Um, so we have rhythm, and that's bass and drums. And then the harmonic section, which is usually um, guitar and keys. And then the um, melodic section, which is typically, typically vocals and sometimes guitar and keys. So I'll pass it on over to Joey to talk to us about the rhythm section. Hey, so Manny touched a little bit on uh, what the rhythm section does. It creates this rhythmic and sonic foundation between me and Patty. Well, uh, we'll meet these things called groove points. Basically what that is, is when the kick matches what she's playing with her, her plucks, if you will. And those are called groove points, and what they do is they create this heartbeat of the song. So, the heartbeat is usually determined by whatever the pattern the drummer is playing here. So, to kind of help you wrap your mind around that, we're going to do a quick exercise. I'm going to play a pattern on the kick drum, and I want you to clap along with it to figure out, this is how you figure out the heartbeat of a song, and that's usually what people are clapping to in songs. Okay, ready? So I'm going to need your guys' participation. Ready? And okay, so 
there's, there's two kinds of locking in. There's one where we are literally playing the exact same thing, like ba 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 ba. So that's one kind of locking in. And the other one is where it's like this. The general rhythm is the same, but it's like I, I might like move a kick to like a different voice or something, or the same pattern, the same rhythm all together, but it doesn't. It's not like exactly what we just did. Is what I'm trying to say, basically. So let's give you two examples of both of those kind of locking in. So there's not locking in, which is eh, and then there's both two kinds of locking in. So you know, generally they would be for different verse and chorus feel. So we're going to do, do a chorus of the song Cornerstone, and that's where we are completely locked in. So pay attention closely to the patterns that we're playing. that it's like bam 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 it's like cool this is locked in and that's that creates more like energy it's like sweet you're locked in it's great and the other form the other one would be like generally for more verse feels so that so it's still locked in it's still good but it's slightly different like we're adding or taking away notes so just just watch setting or hey any setting really it's just really important to get that sonic foundation and now okay two things there's something called driving feel and open feel and that applies to each section of the, the band and so for us what that looks like driving is what we've been doing this whole time chorus and verses feel it's like cool we're, we're kind of we're, you know, we're, we're driving we're in the driver's seat right and there's also open feel which is more um, like atmospheric and uh, less busy, if you will. So what that looks like is her playing like boom. Le less, less like grooving and like pushing, so just less notes overall, and then I'm just kind of like cymbals and pretty stuff. So let's give you, we, you've been seeing the driving feel, so now we're going to give you an example of an open feel in a song that we do called Once and For All. Distinct. There is an appropriate time for that and an inappropriate time, just how there is an appropriate and inappropriate time for driving. So it's important for you to discern when that time is. And the last thing we're going to touch on quick is called tacit. Have any of you ever heard of tacit? It's a complicated musical term, and it's something that um, it's quite difficult to play, but it's something we've all been working on this year. Um, so I, I can't really explain, but we'll just demonstrate it. So you don't play anything. Tacit, you don't play anything. Thank you, thank you. That was really good. Okay, so when you hear tacit, it's like, okay, so I'm playing anything. So you can be like, all right, yo, you. So you're going to tacit during the first four measures, and you know, tacit here. So you can just get a new word in your vocabulary. Isn't that great? Yeah. So that's it. I'm going to turn it over to Matt now. But yeah. Cool. Okay. Can everyone see me slash hear me? Cool. Okay. So I'm Matt, and I play the keys. And can someone tell me which? Um, which section of the band that is? Yeah, harmonic, perfect. 
So just like the rhythms, the rhythmic section, their goal was to create the rhythmic and sonic foundation. And they do this by complementing each other. So the harmonic section, we have to be different than the rhythmic section because we're cooler than them, obviously. <laughs> so we do the complete opposite of them. We, our, our goal is to create texture, and we do that by contrasting each other. Um, so, we'll get more into that later, I guess. Um, but the first way that we'll show how we can contrast each other is by showing the different feels that Joey was talking about. So, Hannah is our guitarist. Uh, she's great. And she's going to demonstrate what we call a driving feel. So a driving feel, it's very rhythmic and it's very, um, it's more complex and just like Joey was saying, it's driving. Um, so yeah, the best way is for you to just hear it. Yes. What's a slow song, like a pop song that's really slow? Oceans? Yeah, you know that Oceans drummer on YouTube where like they create this like nice environment and some like, great chords and then like all of a sudden it's like boom boom ka boom boom ka and like it's awful, it ruins everything. So you can't always, you can't always be driving in music because it's just not always appropriate. Um, so we also have open feel, um, just like the rhythmic section had. And it's just more, it's more open. So if you're a guitarist, it might look like um, just strumming straight down and leaving it at that for each chord change. Or it might be finger picking. If you're a keys player, it could be um, just playing the chord changes or arpeggiating and stuff. Um, so Hannah's gonna demonstrate that for us as well. room for other instruments to play. So, everyone got that? Yeah, sweet, okay. So, since we're the harmonic section, we have to be different, and we have to contrast each other. So, we can use those two different types of feels to be able to contrast each other. Um, and then that is how we can create texture by doing different things. So, what we're gonna do now is we're going to play do you guys know the song Forever by Chris Tomlin? Like, forever, guys, people. Yeah. Um, not by my vocals, but better people than me. <laughs> um, but, yeah. We're going to play that chorus three times. The first time, Hannah is going to drive, and I'll play more of an open feel. The second time, I'll drive, and she'll play an open feel. And then the third time, we're both going to drive. 
so that you can see like how conflicting it is when there's two instruments driving at the same time. Yeah, to hear it? Okay, 
Yeah, so that's what she's going to be playing. She's going to take it out for um, one part of it, and then she'll bring it back in. And also, I want you guys to also pay attention to which feel Hannah and I are playing. Um, and then at the end, we'll ask you, you know, what was I playing, what was Hannah playing? And we need to communicate with each other what we're playing first. So give us a second. <laughs> Yeah, confused and just like, oh, 
what I want to do here. So, so like it's really, really important for that lead vocalist to be confident, not prideful or cocky, but um, when you're confident, you can, uh, we like to look at it this way, like the audience is giving you that attention, they're, they're watching you, they're following you, and the point of that lead vocalist is to take that attention and then redirect it back to God. And if they can't do that successfully, it just kind of becomes this show, and that's never what we want to do especially when we're leading any kind of praise and worship, right? Um, so a big part of that um, is also like mic placement. Um, well, I mean, that's not a big part of it, but like a piece of being like a solid vocalist is just like, just owning the mic, not like diva style, but like, don't be like, you know, like hanging down here, just be like, and if for a sound tech, it's really important for the vocalist to just like have it right, right in the meat of their face. Sounds kind of weird, right? But, but if that's that's where it catches like that main part of their voice. So you as a vocalist can serve your sound tech and your band by like not moving it around a bunch because then your sound tech's like trying to move your move you up and down and then they can't like they can't keep you at this normal level. And so like my place and placement is a huge thing. So always just like right right in front of your mouth. Don't, don't go below because then the sound is just going straight out and it's not really going into the microphone. That's a really small thing, but it, it's a huge thing ultimately. Um, so we're going to talk about um, the difference between leading and supporting in the melodic section. So we're going to, um, have you guys ever heard the song Draw Me Close? Draw me close to you. Yeah, that's all right. Okay, so Kirsten's gonna represent that lead role, and Maddie's gonna represent the supportive role. So I want you to watch for a few things. I want you to watch where they're standing on stage, who's looking at who, like Kirsten's confidence level, and just so just just watch for those things. Um, so we'll just do one chorus of it, and Matt will play piano behind, um, just so we can do that, that chorus one time. Show you what it means to lead really well. Where, where was Maddie looking the first time? 
when we were doing it well at Kirsten, right? So she wasn't really looking at Kirsten's like, I mean, where was she actually looking? Kirsten's, like the back of Kirsten's head. But you guys didn't really know that. You just saw her kind of like directing her attention towards Kirsten. And if you can do that as a vocalist or even as an instrumentalist, um, when that, when whoever is leading a song or like soloing, so if I'm doing a guitar solo, it's good for whoever was initially leading to redirect their attention so that whoever is taking on that lead role can have that time to take over the lead role. Um, and so for Maddie, to redirect attention, and you don't have to be like looking at Kirsten's eyes, but if you can direct your attention towards that person, um, then you know who's leading. Um, the other thing too is like, along with that, if we're all doing our own thing, even if Kirsten's leading, and Maddie's like, you know, having a great time with Patty over on the bass, and I'm like tuning my guitar off to the side and doing all these things. Like you don't, it's like confusing to figure out who to look at, right? So just like one way of, of emphasizing the importance of just like directing attention so that they can ultimately redirect it back to God. All right, so thank you vocalist, you did a great job. They don't actually sing like that diva style, so don't worry, they never sing like that against each other. All right, um, one quick thing about sound, um, or a few things, I guess. Uh, being the sound tech, um, do we have any sound techs in here? Any people doing sound? Okay, that's okay. If you ever get to do sound, it's really important um, for, for the band to know, like when you're setting up, um, your instruments and you're getting ready for like worship practice or even like Sunday mornings or something. Um, we, we really, really strive to have a clean stage. So we try, you see these like lines of chords going around and they're all kind of like organized and they're not like strewn through the entire stage. Like the cleaner the stage, the more room you have to move around and like enjoy your time of worship and like interact with other bandmates and the bigger thing for sound is if um, there's ever any like issues that need to be solved, like troubleshooting, like one chord is plugged into the wrong spot in the snake or something like that, it's really nice to have a clean stage so that you can go fix things really quickly and not have to like, you know, go through this huge like tangled mess, right? So for your sound techs, like sanity, it's always super awesome when you can keep a clean stage. Um, Do you guys have monitors here when you guys are on stage? Do you have like monitor boxes that you have like kind of a mix so you can hear what you're hear what you're doing? Yeah, they're too wide. Okay. Okay, cool. So I'm not gonna get super into depth with this, but um, let's see. Um, a vocalist when they have their own monitor box, what's what's the thing that they usually ask for the most? Of your voice. Yeah, more of their voice. And usually the issue with that. It's okay to have more of their voice, but if they have every other instrument in their in their mix, of course they're gonna want more of their voice. So the first thing that you wanna do before you ask for more of yourself is maybe less of someone else. And you're not like, don't take it as an insult if someone wants less of you in their mix. <laughs> Just know that um, uh, we, we finally switched over to having like in-ear monitors, which is like super helpful for not having a ton of stage volume, but um, if everyone were to have their own like monitor, like speaker monitor, and everyone wanted more of themselves, you wouldn't be able to hear more of yourself. You just hear like this huge jumbled mess. And it's a problem when there's more volume on stage than coming out of your speakers. So be mindful of that and like help your sound tech out. If if you know you need more of yourself, you you need to know like um, like Joey, um, our drummer, he definitely needs bass. He doesn't always need, um, you know, that glue role that Holly or Matt was playing um, because he doesn't need that to do his role well. Um, and a vocalist, a good thing to have for a vocalist would be like a keyboard because they play a lot of like um, that like tonic like in the key. They they help them get their their key and their their notes for their for their lines right. 
Uh, but they don't need my electric, like my lead lines and my frilly, you know, showy stuff. They don't need any of that to do their role well. So um, if you have questions about like what you really need in your monitor as a music, as an instrumentalist, I would love to talk with you afterwards. Um, because it helps, it helps you like protect your ears because you're not like asking for everything in the world. And also trust your sound tech when you're like, man, this doesn't sound very good in my monitor. Is this what it sounds like out front? It's, it's not that way at all. Um, because you're not supposed to have everything that's out, out front. You just need what, what you need to do your role well. So trust your sound tech. Um, what, what is out there for your congregation to experience is not gonna be what you hear in your monitor. So just trust. <laughs> um, another thing that's like really helpful for, um, it, it's helpful that I'm on stage and I'm playing guitar, but um, sometimes the sound person can feel a little bit, um, I don't know, disunified from the group if they don't really know what's going on, they don't know what's happening on Sunday, or they don't know what, um, you know, what songs you're doing, what's, what's the message that you're trying to portray through the songs that you're doing. Uh, and so, like, it, it's really helpful for, for, for the sound tech to know what's going on so they can serve you as a team and they can help you, you know, build dynamic, you know, like make dynamic builds when you need to build, um, you know, bring up a vocalist when they need to be leading the song and they're not supporting anymore. So like it's helpful for the sound tech to know what's going on. And then they, they feel like they're contributing just as much as you because if you didn't have a sound tech, it wouldn't sound that awesome. So try and bless your sound tech with just keeping them in the loop. Um, and one last thing about um, serving your sound tech. When you're setting up, you you don't want to, um, I guess, when you're starting to set up, the first thing you want to set up is your own stuff. So if you're a guitarist, you start setting up your pedal board or your guitars and you start tuning and like a vocalist starts singing. She's like practicing her lines. She's like warming up, screaming away in the mic. The bass, um, you know, it's like starting to talk to the drummer. So, um, and the drummer starts tuning his drum, right? And you're like, you're trying to figure out what the heck's going on. You're trying to troubleshoot. You're trying to get people to like focus on practice. And it's all getting really loud. And there's one point where the sound tech wants to try and do this. He wants to do a sound check, right? All right. Hey guys, I'm trying to talk here. So, you're right, right, you're muted, and Holly's playing a patch, Joey's tuning his drums, Matt's chilling with Joey. So we're doing like all of our own things, and it's, did you see how it gradually just started to get louder? And I'm like trying to talk over. So like imagine everyone's unmuted, and they're trying to talk, and they're like trying to get their own way, and the sound, sound person's like, I, I, uh, I need to sound check Kirsten on vocals. Anyone there? Is anyone there? Like, did you see how it gradually got louder and you couldn't, you couldn't understand what I was saying? All you could do was like focus on what Holly was playing and if Matt was, you know, starting to bang on Joey's drums. You know, like all these things are going on. So the best thing that you can do is not play your instrument until you're asked to sound check. That's like the biggest help to the sound person. Um, and ultimately, like, you'll get a chance to play, you'll get a chance to tune, and if you need to, come earlier so you can tune and be all ready. Like, vocalists, like, warm up so that you're not doing it when the sound tech is trying to sound check, right? Um, those are just really, really simple ways to serve um, your sound person. Um, and ultimately, like, when you, um, when you come and you, you join a worship team, you don't get to be the lead player all the time, right? Like Matt was saying, like if you're classically trained um, as a pianist, like you're used to playing all of those roles. And so for a keys player to like come and play two notes, and they're just like, am I doing anything here? And then the lead guitar is just like rocking out, and then all of a sudden they're just like doing this little shimmery patch. It's kind of boring, it's kind of sad. Like all of these pieces like have really, really valuable roles in making something sound awesome and ultimately not a distraction for the congregation. 
Um, because if you become a distraction because you're all wanting to lead and do your own thing and be a bunch of divas, like it's super distracting and you're you're taking away an opportunity for someone to encounter God in worship, in musical worship. Um, so just trust that the role that you have in your band, even when it changes, is still valuable. Same with sound person, like trust that your sound tech, like their their role in your worship team is just as valuable as the lead vocalist. Um, because they're tasked with making, creating this place uh, for people to worship and not be distracted by music. Um, so I'll turn it over to Patty as we continue the worship. So if you're here for the first workshop, we talked about how worship is driving worth to something and uh, and about how we want everything that we do to be pointing towards God and not just when we're on stage, not just when we're playing music. And part of what we've been talking about for this musical workshop um, is about how to serve one another and like create space for one another. And I don't know if you remember, but we mentioned how the melodic section, the vocals especially, are the ones that deliver the message of our music. You know, most of us instrumentalists, sound techs, we're not saying anything. Um, we're not conveying anything through our words, but the vocalists are doing that the most. So, you know, all of us in the band support that. Like the um, bass and the drums, we create a foundation that is as um, as dependable as we can, and then the, um, the the harmonic section creates space for one another, so it's not distracting when they're all playing, trying to get attention, and same with the vocalist. So now we're at the point of delivering the message. So what, what does it mean for us to deliver the message, and what does that look like? Um, we've, we've talked as a ministry that we want to be really intentional about being gospel-centered in everything that we share. And even when we're among Christian peers, it's not just about evangelizing for the first time, but like what we said this morning, you know, respond to the gospel is a daily decision. So there's no venue that sharing the gospel is inappropriate. And so for each of our songs then, we want to make sure that they are gospel-centered. Like, you know, looking at the lyrics, looking at the message, message of the songs. Um, is there any depth to what we're saying? You know, like some songs, like they're, they're nice to play, they're easy to sing along to, but they don't have a lot of meat. But we want to make sure that the, the lyrics of each of the songs that we play have something to, to uh, point back to Christ with and not just, you know, song that is cool or popular these days. So something that we do as homework at the beginning of the year is song studies. And for each of the songs that we learn, we analyze the lyrics and figure out, you know, what scriptural references are in the song. And what is the song useful for? You know, what kind of context is the song good for? And who is the song speaking to? And, and who is appropriate to sing the song? So just as an example, um, you know, like nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, that is a huge song about the sacrifice of, of Jesus. And, you know, blood in general is a really strange um, concept to be like singing joyfully about, but it brings us back to the Old Testament and how and actually Hebrews too, like how, how God um, required a sacrifice, you know, required, required a payment for our sins, and ultimately Jesus was that payment. So, you know, we you know, pull those references out of the song, and then when we talk, either before or after the song, we make references to that. Um, but going from song to song, we can't necessarily assume that the audience will, like, catch up on what the lyrics are saying and how it ties to the next one. So, like, our set this morning, we sang... No, not one, and then we sang nothing but the blood. Um, you know, when we were planning the program, we we're thinking to ourselves, you know, there's no first song, there's no greater love than the love that God demonstrated to us. And then, so how did He demonstrate that love to us? On the cross, by His sacrifice on the cross. So that's like how we're tying together, and that's our rationale for singing the two songs back to back. But we're not necessarily expecting you to connect the dots. So, um, you know, we talked a little bit at the beginning, and then we talked in between songs to kind of help you along. So I know um, at my, for example, my youth group back at home, the, the worship team is really anxious to say anything during worship, you know, so it's just like song, 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 it's like, a, like, it's like karaoke worship time, you know, you just like sing along, along for the ride, but I would challenge you if you feel like that, you know, push yourself to maybe a first step would just be reading a verse that relates to the song that you will sing or just sing, and then working your way up to, you know, saying a little bit more than just the verse and a little more application, just to help the audience the congregation track where your mind is at. Um, but like a huge thing about all of this is just intentionality when you're planning a set. You know, um, 
not throwing it together last minute, not throwing it together based on, you know, if you're, a, if you're a guitarist, not just picking the songs that has the best riffs or something like that, or not just the songs that have the best groove, but what songs point, are pointing to the gospel in a cohesive um, message that you can deliver. Um, but I think the last thing I'll say is, um, actually, Pastor Elvin touched on this this morning when he talked about the fruit of the Spirit and how we don't like squeeze the fruit of the Spirit out of us. It just comes when we are filled with the Spirit. And for us to be in ministry, we shared a little bit about how, you know, um, it can become routine sometimes, and if you're on a routine, it can become routine sometimes, to just go through the motions um, and to just, like, put on a show when you're up here. And, you know, we're definitely not all feeling it, like, deeply emotionally all the time, but it's, it's dangerous for us to depend on this time as our only time of worship or our only time of, of communion with God. It's really important for us as a ministry, um, us in ministry, and if you're on a worship team, to um, be spiritually disciplined enough to be filled up so that when you're on stage ministering to others, it's out of the overflow. You're not either, you're not, either not like squeezing yourself dry or like grasping for things to share. Um, so yeah, intentionality and spiritual discipline to, to minister out of the overflow. Yeah, so that's all that we have like prepared to share. Do you guys have any questions on any of the musical stuff, or set planning, or even worship from the first workshop, if you have questions. Uh, we have a few people who play the violin, and I was wondering, uh, are they useful, or, you know, <laughs> crazy? Or, or if they are, how do we, what, what do they fit? Turn the mic on first. Um, I would say they fit really well in the harmonic section. Um, any any stringed instrument. Um, we on keyboards every once in a while have a string patch that we'll play, and that adds a really really nice texture to anything you're playing. Like, and every once in a while it can slide into the melodic section, and it can play like um, if you're doing like Come Thou Fount, it could play that lead line, um, that one melodic line. You know. If you wanted to read a verse, if you wanted to take a break between two verses, you could read some scripture passage, and the violin could play um, that lead line or that, that melodic line, and it echoes through the entire time you're reading the scripture, so it reinforces what you're trying to, to get across. Um, so I think it, it, it would fit really, really well in the, the harmonic section, so adding just a nice texture without getting you know, too crazy, but every once in a while you could hop into that melodic section. So I think it would be great in a worship team. You know, uh, but sometimes, for example, when you uh, prepare a sound, uh, do you uh, make uh, different arrangements for each, every single time, or do, uh, every single time the same? But if it's different, do you write them down on how to prepare all these kind of different arrangements? Are you talking about like when we, we put together a set? Yeah, for you, for example, you should just demonstrate for you sounds, right? How, sure. do you, how do you let everybody know what's your role, how to play, what you need to play, do you need to prepare a, a, a full score for them to read? Mm -hmm. so can you, or how do you prepare? Or yeah. do you just let every people play whatever they want on the fly? <laughs> That's a really good question. We, um, um, CTI Music Ministries has a programming department in um, at the beginning of our full-time year, we spend about three weeks um, training musically and um, how to do road life and stuff, but specifically musically, we come um, having um, kind of an MP3 of every song that we're going to learn this year. So we have about, including the Cantonese songs, about just like right around 30 songs that we have to choose from. And obviously the Cantonese songs we don't really use in a worship setting because we play for English speaking congregations basically all the time. But for um, for the sake of preparing for, um, for, what, for what we're doing, we come having learned the specific part of that, that mp3 that we get. So we'll, we'll learn like um, if Maddie is singing a lead, a lead like vocalist piece and, and Chris is going to be backing up um, or singing a harmony part, she'll learn the harmony part that is in that song, like on the radio or 
whatever we're resourced with. So we learn that specific part, and then we come to training, and then we piece it all together. So we already come knowing what we're exactly going to play, for the most part, um, so that we're not like trying to divvy out, okay, who's going to lead here, who's going to support here, can I have a solo in here anywhere? Like, you just come knowing. Um, so we, we work, we do cover songs of, you know, like the top 40. So is that answering your question at all? Uh, yeah, sort of. That, but uh, sometimes, for example, last time we read this song this way, some, maybe next time all of a sudden you want to change it a little bit. Sure. And then uh, how do you communicate to, to sort of settle down what you, what, what you uh, do as a group? And uh, I ask this question because I also read the back. I just sometimes, in order to communicate with every single musician to so let them know what they want to do, I have to write every single down, every single note down. And that's very time consuming. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm wondering how other people communicate that it's okay, this is your turn. Or how, you know, how do you, oh no, this time you now don't play this part. So how, do, how do you communicate? So the reason why we, why we do the copy the MP3s as a cover band is for us to be able to learn the music faster um, and like like we have to memorize our parts and everything. Um, but I, I think what would be useful to apply and not just to like our context would be the ideas of like driving and um, open fields. So like you might just be like, okay, so keyboards, you're gonna do the driving feel for verse one, and then guitars will take it over in verse two. So you don't have to like prescribe every single arpeggio or like great sound that they're gonna do, but they understand, okay, this part of the verse, I'll get to play more than just the chord changes on the sheet. Um, but another thing that I think is very useful for us as a group is that we have what we call like a roadmap of each song. Um, it's based off of the recording, but we know like, okay, intro, four measures, verse one, there's a like a, like a turn, instrumental turn between verse one and verse two, and then it's verse two, and then it's a double chorus, and then bridge, and then one chorus at the end. So like, we know, okay, this is at least like the direction that we're going is we're not like waiting around like, are we going to the chorus again kind of thing. Like we know like what we're anticipating. And then from there, like if we're all on the same page, like that can be like, can we cut the double chorus in half? Like it's not really working for us. Then we, then we all know where that is. Or, you know, verse one was kind of dragging. Let's, um, you know, let's, let's, let's have the rhythm section just up, ramp up the energy and not come in, till, and not come in um, later where they were before. So, um, I don't know if this would be helpful for you, but I would think that you know, having a roadmap and being like, okay, at least follow the structure of this song and then we'll change from there. It's easier than like coming in with everybody not knowing or like just come up with what you can figure out kind of thing. Does that help or does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Yeah, like we, we also make our goal to um, meet as a team before every set, um, even though we've played these songs like hundreds of times um, and the meetings can sometimes be really similar. It's still really, really important to have super clear communication um, before the set to make sure that everyone is on the exact same page, um, just musically and message-wise as well. Um, yeah, so that, that might be another place where you could just review so that you're not just entering a set and letting it be spirit-led um, and just doing like, oh, 20, 20 verses or 20 courses or something. Um, you, you have a very prescribed method of doing it. Okay, I have one, one more question. So from what I gather, for each piece that you guys perform, and you say this year you practice about 30, I would imagine you need to spend a number of hours on each piece. And suppose for a church like ours, uh, our team cannot afford that much time, what's the best way to shortcut? If there's any way to shortcut. I mean, obviously, we're not trying to reach the perfection, uh, you know, professional level, uh, but, you know, being realistic about how much time we have, let's say we only have, uh, you know, an hour and a half to practice four songs, and what is the best way to shortcut? To be most efficient about of, of, of the use of our time. So, I think that it is tempting. Um, like, like, I've led worship at my college university before, and it's tempting to really um, 
to show up at practice and, practice and say, okay, these are the songs we're going to do. You have an hour and a half to learn the songs for the initial time, learn your part, figure out who's playing what, and then perfect it all within an hour and a half. And I think like that's kind of unrealistic, um, like an unrealistic expectation. Um, so what I would recommend as a leader would be to um, maybe email the set list um, a few days in advance, email the chord charts as well, and give like a clear expectation like, okay, I want you to play the open, open feel in this part of this song. Um, so that they can spend the time at home to learn all of the parts, and that when they come to practice, it's not learning the songs for the first time, but it's putting it all together. Um, so it takes that whole initial step out, and it's just putting it all together at that point. Um, so it takes a lot more work from the leader, but it ultimately saves so much time, and it allows you to, like, to get one step closer to that. Um, to the excellence that you're striving for. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I got a question similar to that one. In terms of the rest of your lives, I mean, how much time do you, if you could do a percentage, you know, third of your day of sleep, I assume, are you, are you studying the rest of the time or working full time or, or you know, just kind of thing? ministry is a year-long commitment and so we are technically considered full-time missionaries so none of us are studying um, we are committed to this and so um, we do we play about four to six times a week and so we constantly are traveling we spend time getting from one place to another um, setting up interacting with people at each venue sometimes it's one day sometimes it's a week um, has been the longest and then, so spending time with people, um, getting to know the people where we are, sometimes doing recruiting if we're at a college, so spending time talking with interested students. Um, we do sleep. I wouldn't say much. <laughs> are, were you asking rhetorically, like, if we're at home and we're on worship team, how much time do you spend practicing? Right, right. Oh, considering, yeah. Considering um, we have students and, and yeah. people working full time, yeah, I know, I know when I was on worship team at home, one thing that I would do was, like, and this also did my worship theory, they would send out the, the music a week in advance, and so that week when I was driving, I just had the, the MP3s playing, and so, like, at that point, I can already feel, it's like, oh, yeah, they get to, they're, they're building the chorus now, and, like, that will be a double chorus or something, and so when, when we're putting it together, I already have context for how the song fits together, yeah. Your worship director had mentioned to me, um, what's her name? Angela. Angela, thank you. Yeah, she had asked if we were going to touch on the idea of um, how we stay together, and I was talking about the click track that we use because we all have in ears. Um, and she was wondering maybe if you, Joey, could talk about like what it's like to follow that as a drummer because she said sometimes it might seem like, oh, you know, I shouldn't have to have a metronome to keep the beat or whatever. Can you just speak to that? Like, the importance of it, in your opinion? I did not play. I played in church for like four or five years, and I never played with a metronome until actually CT Ireland. Um, from... Oh, okay, sweet. Um, I would say... Click is very important for unifying the band, because then when we can all hear it, this is for in your minors, when we can all hear like, like we're all, do you guys have a plane? Uh, it's ready when you're Okay. Like for example, you hear that? That's, that's what's going through our ears throughout a song. 
and then you like make tempos and stuff. So that just is really like, like when we all hear that, we're just like, like we're just, we, we are just very unified. Um, it's, you know, sometimes you just can't do that. I know at my home church, we don't have that. Um, so it's especially important for um, a drummer to keep time, whatever that looks like. Usually for vocalists, that's keeping time on your hi-hat. They, they love that, that they dig that kind of stuff. So just, I get, what was the question again? Just so I can go back to that. I think, I think it was the idea that sometimes maybe the, the person doing rhythm might feel like it's sort of downgrading for them to have to, yes. to, have okay. to follow um, the metronome. Think of it as you, sh you should be on click so well with your time that you're not playing along to the click, the click is playing along to you. So, and you should have it to the point where you don't even hear click in your ear because you are just burying that, like, like you are playing on top of it. So I know at first it was like, this is so restricting, like me playing here, I want to be more free. But it really improves your musicianship and then once you're playing over it and it's like, yeah, click, follow me, if you can. Like, so that's, that's kind of the point that we are all, and no one in the entire universe has perfect time. It's just something we are always working on. Yeah. So do you have that clicking in your ear during the production or just during practice? All, every, the, all, the whole thing, so. Is it like, like in the background, I mean, just a soft click? For, it's, for, it's usually pretty loud, uh, so that you can always, I, I know for me, like, I'm trying to listen to what Joey's doing, and I'm also trying to listen to this, so if they get off, I can tell. Which, you know, that's never fun. But it's helpful if, like, it's important for everyone to have cl click, so that, you know, if I'm just playing acoustic and one of our vocalists is singing, I'm not waiting for Joey to, like, I can hear it, and then I can just play and keep time for the vocalist. So I think it's really valuable for not just the drummer to have it, but if you can resource your other musicians, I think it's really, really valuable for them as well. And to clarify, um, that's not playing through the main speakers. That's playing through our ears, yeah. Is it, is it, I don't know, you've been using No, no, it's fine. It, we have these little headphones that we kind of stick under our shirt and just kind of hidden. So we, we play that and we plug that into our little in-ear monitor box kind of thing. And we hear it through here, but no one else hears it. Is it, is it like left? Only one year? Oh, no, I, yeah, you, you can do both. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But I think that would be, I mean, like I said, I, I know nothing about music, but it seems to be a distraction to have all these different things going on and try to hear. It can be. That's why we, we, when she was talking earlier about our mixes, like for me, I don't want to hear the, the glue. I don't need to hear the backup vocals. Like, I need bass, maybe, you know, for a drummer's standpoint, I need bass and maybe some lead vocals and, you know, just a light amount of some other stuff. So then your ears aren't like muddy and just exploding with stuff I don't actually want to hear. So. Well, and like for me as a keyboard player, click is at a volume that um, when everyone's in, I can't hear it, which is, I, li I like that because then I can really follow the drums. So if he's ever off, which he never is. Um, never. <laughs> if he's ever off, then I'm still following him. Um, but it's high enough that when uh, it's just like me and Matt, or me and Hannah, I can hear it so that we're still on when the drums are not on. So each of us has a different volume. Like, I'm, I'm sure for Joey, it's like pounding in your head because he's the rhythmic foundation, but it's different for each of us. So, um, for the bass, uh, do you, how do you come up with the bass line? Do you, like, copy what you hear in recordings, or do you, like, go off the chord chain and use a Um. I start from copying the the recording, or at least like finding places where, where they're where they're throwing in um, a bass line. But otherwise, go to ones are off of the pentatonic scale. If you're familiar with that one, so like wherever you're wherever you know it is, you know like going up one and then one two three four like or if you're like here, then the three and the three and the five, sorry, the five and the octave are the two like I can't shake in the air, but like do. Do 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 like something like that, or the pentatonic like do 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 like that's off the pentatonic. So there, there's the theory that I fall back on to come up with riffs here and there, but otherwise I start by trying to mimic the ones in the recording. Yeah. But Hannah's been playing bass a lot longer, so if you have any other thoughts. No, I mean like it's just 
I think a really good place to start is playing with one and five. Because um, then you have some contrast, but um, it, the important thing that bass needs to know is to not get so fancy that it takes away from things like the most important thing is to lock in with drums. And if it gets in the way of doing that, it's not worth it. Because um, you're a much better bassist if you can stay locked in um, than if you, you know, try and get all fancy and then you get off and then everything screws up. So one and five is a really good place to start. And then when you get comfortable with that, you can add, you know, like a four in or a three. So. Bases are unappreciated, and the best bases are ones that you don't even realize are playing because they're just like sitting in it so well. The ones that are distracting are the ones that don't actually know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last questions? Any more? One last question? We're gonna wrap up. Okay, let's give CTI a warm round of applause. Uh, one thing I wanted to do, because I just I know that your tour, like you're coming to wrap right in a few weeks, and so um, I was wondering if we could pray for you. Maybe you guys can come down here, and I'll just say a prayer, and you guys can just extend your hands out as we pray for them, because they're going to be wrapping up their tour. They've been going together for about a year now, so we just want to, you know, thank them and pray for them as they go off from here. Okay, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the CTI team. We are so thankful that you got to bring them here to lead our worship, to teach us, to give us great um, teaching for the workshops. And Lord, we pray for each and every one of them, that whatever you have ahead of them this summer, um, and also for the rest of their, their lives and the rest of this year, Lord, I pray you will guide them into uh, areas of ministry, areas of leadership, that you would bless them in their churches, back at home, um, wherever they go, Lord, I pray you will lead them and guide them. We thank you for their ministry. We thank you for the blessing of them coming to visit us. And we pray that you will guide all of us here as we continue to seek after you, that we will be led by your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you. One more room. All right. All right, thanks, you guys. If you want to have any more questions, you can ask them after.